Why did the Japanese send the super battleship Yamato against the US fleet at Okinawa instead of preserving it for the invasion of Japan? Especially considering that the proposal for the operation was heavily opposed by various commanders involved. The high command wants the second fleet to sortie for Okinawa without air cover, with fuel enough only for a one-way trip. In short, the high command wants us to engage in a kamikaze mission. No, this is not even a kamikaze mission. For that implies the chance of chalking up a worthy target, I told Kusaka, the Vice Admiral of the Combined Fleet Chief of Staff. That our little fleet has no chance against the might of the enemy forces and that such an operation would be a genuine suicide sortie. Aruga, the captain of the Yamato, and the Chief of Staff of the Second Fleet Morishita agreed with me. The commander of the Second Fleet, Admiral Ito, said nothing, so I do not know his opinion of the proposal. Of course, some might note that this was just an irrational action at the end of the war, yet there are various points that indicate that this operation had some rationality behind it. In any way, the result was a complete disaster for the Imperial Japanese Navy. More than 4,000 Japanese sailors had perished in this largely symbolic expedition. The Americans had won their victory at a cost of just 10 planes and 12 airmen. Now be aware, in this case many of the sources are memoirs, which are generally quite problematic as sources as often discussed in my videos, but well, it is the best we have currently. Before we look at the various reasons, let us look at the Japanese orders, which are rather vague. The Imperial Navy Force and the 6th Area Army should attack with all power and annihilate the warships in the vicinity of Okinawa after X Day, which was the 6th of April. The Surface Special Attack Force should be depart Bungo Strait at dawn of Y-1 day and penetrate into the sea west of Okinawa at dawn of Y day and attack and annihilate the enemy surface warships and transport group. Y day will be the 8th of April. Note there is the claim that the Yamato should be beached and turned into a fortress, yet there is no note of it in the official orders or operational plan. The historians Lenger and Alberg, drawing extensively on Japanese sourcing make no specific mention of beaching. The evidence of beaching appears to be drawn from the recollections of various officers and men. For example, it is mentioned by Mitsuru Yoshida and Enzin on the Yamato, in his book, and by Mitsu Fujita in a post-war interview. Fujita is a problematic source, generally, and must be handled carefully. The historian Russell Spohr is the most detailed on this point and makes the claim that the idea was raised in, in planning and approved by Admiral Suemo Toyoda, commander-in-chief of the combined fleet, although Hara also notes about the crew of his light cruiser. Everyone was busy checking weapons and instruments. Almost 100 men were sharpening bayonets to be used after we went around at Okinawa. Justin, who are head on on many other Pacific theater videos, thinks that the beaching likely did not come from the top and that it was just a general understanding or decided outside the specific operational orders. Anyway. Let us look at the various points that support sending the Yamato towards Okinawa. Be aware that these points take under consideration Japanese thinking, knowledge and values of the time. So keyboard, warrior hindsight and 21st western moral codes don't apply here, because in the dream dark of spring of 1945 there was only war. In case you have little knowledge of Japanese thinking of the time, you might get a minor glimpse of it in my video on why the Japanese attacked the United States in the first place. One major argument against such a mission is that the Yamato would be very valuable defending Japan during an invasion. As such, it should be preserved and this makes a lot of sense at first. Which also puzzled me, by the way. Yet if one considers the situation at this point in the war, it makes far less sense. Task Force 58, the fast carrier forces, now with over 700 planes and new battleships, cruisers and carriers, would attack aircraft plants and airfields in Tokyo and its vicinity on February 16th, 17th and 25th. So even US carrier planes were attacking the Japanese home islands. One major issue is hiding ships is not particularly easy and hiding the biggest of them all is even less so. And we are not talking about the theoretical situation here neither, since in March 1945, so the month before the Yamato was sent on its death ride, the US Navy and US Air Force made it rather apparent that Japan was no longer a safe harbor for the Imperial Japanese Navy. On March 19, 1945, Task Force 58 attacked Kura Harbor, where the remnants 
of the Imperial Japanese Navy were located, including the Yamato. Task Force 58 lofted 158 Hell Divers and Avengers at Kura Harbor, escorted by Hellcats and Corsairs. Although only moderate damage was inflicted, namely 5 hits on 4 battleships, badly damaging a carrier and light cruisers, the situation was rather clear. Powerful, extremely competent carrier groups had completely dominated Japanese coastal waters and begun the process of clearing the enemy's skies of meaningful defense. This was an attack by carrier strike force, but it was not the only threat to Japanese ships and shipping operations in the home waters. After initial reluctance, Curtis LeMay agreed to devote part of one wing of laying mines in Japanese waterways. The operation began in late March 1945 and almost immediately proved itself. To date remains one of the least known, most efficient and cost-effective air campaigns in history. These mining operations also included naval mines that were dropped in late March at the approaches to Kure. Hara notes that the Japanese destroyer was lost due to running into such a mine and remarked, even home waters were no longer safe. Perhaps this fact had influenced the decision to throw our few remaining ships at Okinawa. Now the next point will not surprise any long-time viewers or those who know a little bit about the Japanese forces in World War II, namely the ability to hit your right knee with your left one, inter-service rivalry. So in other words, the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy were bitching about each other. It is important to point out here that the Japanese battleships for a long time during the war had seen rather little action, which of course could be interpreted in many ways. Until the Battle of Leyte in October 1944, our battleship force was relatively immune from loss or damage and did maintain its fighting efficiency. To the uninitiated, these ships must have appeared to be great floating forts. The key by which Japan might recover from a hopeless situation. But a fleet of super dreadnoughts alone, however powerful their guns, could no longer qualify as the main striking force in a decisive fleet engagement. The Battle of Leyte Gulf was a defeat of the Imperial Japanese Navy and resulted in heavy losses, yet the Yamato survived the engagement with almost no damage and so little action. Hara notes, Then the combined fleet chief of staff Vice Admiral Kusaka turned to the second fleet chief of staff Morishita and explained that the high command and especially army members has been dismayed by Yamato's breakoff at Leyte. Kusaka said that he felt it was not Morishita's fault, for he had worked a wonder in dodging all torpedoes, while Mushashi, which was Yamato's sister ship, fell victim to them. Yet he said that Tokyo was displeased that Yamato had returned without firing 18.5 inch guns at the enemy. Morishita took these remarks very hard. It should be added here that the Yamato actually fired its guns at Leyte Gulf against an escort carrier. But back to the point. Some might not really consider this an argument, but we must take into account the overall context in Japanese culture here. Hara noted that the chief of staff of the combined fleet said that the whole nation would hate the navy if Yamato would survive the war intact, and that some spoke about Yamato as floating hotel for idle, inept admirals. According to Hara, this resulted in the following reaction. The commander of the second fleet, Vice Admiral Ito, broke his long silence at this point and said, I think we are given an appropriate chance to die. A samurai lives so that he is always prepared to die. That ended all argument. This needs a bit of context. You need to be aware that at that point the Japanese were conducting regularly so-called kamikaze missions. Although be aware that the word is from a pronunciation error, they were actually called special attack corps or units. Luckily if you had an issue with pronunciation errors you wouldn't have made it this far in the video anyway. But back on track. In other words, a lot of Japanese aviators and others like the Kaiten and Man Torpedoes were engaging in suicide missions, especially the prospect of a crippled Yamato striking her colors to the enemy forever stained the honor of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Similarly, the Japanese civilians starved and were killed by firebombings. Considering the extensive losses the Navy and Army had already faced, it was only a matter of time before the crews of the Yamato and the other ships would die. So now we look at another source. For this we take a look at the Japanese monographs. This was a post-war project by the Allies that instructed the Japanese to write an official history of the war in the Pacific. These were written by former Japanese officers, although with the issue that most of the official records had been destroyed. 
According to the Japanese monographs about Okinawa, the reason for the attack was as follows. On 4th April, Commander-in-Chief of the Combined Fleet Toyota, feeling keenly the need for the Navy to turn the tide of the battle by striking a mortal blow at the enemy before the moment was lost, the enemy could be expected to put the two airfields in use around 10th of April at the latest, decided to use the entire strength of the naval air forces and activate surface special attack units, throwing them into Okinawa in a general attack with the Okinawa garrison forces and issued the necessary orders to the forces under his command. Whereas other forces note that the surface force with the Yamato should provide a diversion attack that allows the special attack groups aka kamikazes to break through, although once again there is no specific mention of this in the operational orders, it seems entirely plausible that this was an intended impact. Rear Admiral Kozaka Ariga told the men on board Yamato that the sortie would divert American resources away from the planned air attacks. Hara notes the following conversation. While enemy carriers are occupied in opposing our fleet, Kanoya, as the southernmost airfield of Kyushu, will fling hundreds of kamikaze planes at Okinawa. The Combined Fleet Chief of Staff Vice Admiral Kusaka assured the commander of the 2nd Destroyer Squadron in Kumura that this decoy sortie will not end in vain, as did his last one. Similarly, another factor that might have influenced the decision and the assumptions of the chances of a breakthrough might have been the wrong assumptions of the effectiveness of Japanese attacks. For the 5th of April 1945, Ugaki notes in his diary, We didn't know the result of our attack, except the reports of I am crashing on a carrier, but judging from the enemy telephones in hurricane confusion and requests for help, it was most certain we destroyed four carriers. The issue is, not a single carrier was destroyed in this action. Another aspect which might must be considered is that this also might be about pleasing the Emperor or maybe just avoiding a confrontation with him. According to the diary of Admiral Matomo Ugaki, who was once Chief of Staff of the Combined Fleet and later Commander of the Imperial Japanese Navy 5th Air Fleet, the main reason was the following. The main reason for the operation was said to be that when the Chief of the Naval General Staff reported the battle situation to the Emperor, the Emperor asked him if it was a general attack employing only air power and he replied to the throne that the whole strength of the Navy was employed. The responsibility of the Chief of the Naval General Staff, who is solely responsible for planning and assisting the Emperor in operational matters, should be called great. Here it would be great to have access to the original and extensive Japanese skills, since reason in English can be imprecise and imply causation, thanks to Rando for pointing this out. In German, we have a proverb, es war der Auslöser, aber nicht der Grund. It was the trigger, yet not the reason. So Ugaki might have meant trigger, not reason. But I don't know. To summarize, there were many different reasons and or opinions on why the Japanese sent out the Yamato against Okinawa. For me, the most rallying aspect here is that in case of an invasion of Japan, it was rather unlikely that the Yamato could have been preserved anyway, since the US Army Air Force and the US Navy likely would have made sure to bomb it into submission beforehand anyway. Well, I hope you learned something new. Thank you to Justin for helping me out with a lot of sources, providing additional information and answering various questions that came up during the writing of this video. Thank you to Andrew for reviewing the script. Thank you to all my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. As always, sources are listed in the description. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you for watching and see you next time.